Good morning, good evening, and whatever service you're listening to. I hope that you are enjoying your isolation, and uh, hopefully that this can be a, a good worship for you to, to come as a family and, and just worship God for a little time. So uh, wherever you're at, would you worship with us? So glad you are tuned in with us. We are 
are wanting to celebrate and worship with you. We're excited for this opportunity. Each week we make a few more improvements, so hopefully this is something that is just reaching into your home and reaching into your heart. There's some announcements I want you to know about. Number one is your ability to watch live. So you're able to to see us uh, uh, Saturday, 6 p.m. You're able to tune in again at 9 a.m. on Sunday morning and then 10.30 uh, a.m. as well. And so just want to make sure. And you can go on demand anytime you want. If you go to our website, brookingsnaz.org, you can click on watch live or watch past sermons. And so you can go back. If you missed last week, you're able to do that. So I wanted to let you know about that as well. The next thing I want you guys to know about is Holy Week Family Worship. So we made some changes. We've got some great things in store for you, which uh, hopefully you got the email that was sent out on Friday about um, coming here by the church tomorrow morning between 11 and noon, and then again between 1 and 2 to pick up some packets for you that are going to help you engage as a family with the Holy Week worship experience. Every day, the staff is going to have a new teaching for you starting on Monday all the way through Good Friday. So you're going to see those links and the ability to connect with that. Do not miss this opportunity as a family. And again, it's us being able to worship together as we walk through the Holy Week. So make sure you tune into that. Also, our BNAS, our Discovery Kids, is online. And so the entire Discovery Kids team is working really hard. We started that last weekend. We're doing it again this weekend at 9 a.m. You'll be able to, no, not 9 a.m., at 10 a.m. You'll be able to tune in. Um, my cue card is right over here, so I'm watching that. <laughs> You'll be able to tune in, get your kids connected with this. This is, again, their way to be involved and engaged with the ongoing teaching here at Brookings Church of the Nazarene. So make sure you're a part of that. And then our youth group is online, again, Wednesdays at 6 p.m. Pastor Melissa has been leading that. It's been growing every time, and it's just neat to see that connection happening with our youth every Wednesday, 6 p.m., so don't miss that. That's all on your Church Center app, your ability to go there, check out the events, and to see the different things that are going on. And then lobby time. So we did our first lobby time tonight. I think we got to talk to uh, Bill and Shannon uh, uh, Parrish were on, Stan and Diane Morris were on, who else was there? Tracy Brown was on, and we just had a wonderful conversation, people gathering in the lobby. Uh, we've provided that using Zoom technology, so there we provided the links for you using your church center app. You can go to lobby time and register for which time you want to come. It's just a great way to see each other and gather before we uh, tune into the live stream. So just these are things I want to make sure you know about. And then lastly, the outreach opportunities. Again, our church has been on the move with serving the community. And this outreach opportunity app that's on your church center app is a way to connect with what the needs are, how to get involved, how to serve. Even in this crazy time that we're in right now, there are still plenty of opportunities. And so this ministry mobilizer, you got to check it out. And it's a great way to just be mobilized for Christ in the kingdom of God in our community. At this time, I'm going to have uh, Mendy come up, and uh, we're going to worship through giving. So come on up here. Welcome. We're so glad you're here today to worship with us. This is a time when we worship through giving. The resources that God has given to us, we give back to him, and we allow him to use those for his glory. So let's pray here today. Lord God, we love you. We thank you for this time that you have carved out for us, Lord, that we can come to you humbly before you, saying that you are God and King. And so, Lord, we give to you now through worship, and we ask that you would use these resources for your glory. We thank you, Lord, that we have the opportunity to communicate your gospel locally and across the globe. So we pray, Lord, that you would continue to um, bring glory to yourself through what we give to you. We praise you, Lord, and we worship you here today. In your name I pray. Amen. King of heaven, come down. King of heaven. 
says the next day the great crowd that had come for the festival heard that jesus was on his way to jerusalem they took palm branches and went went out to meet him shouting hosanna blessed is he who comes in the name of the lord blessed is the king of israel jesus found a young donkey and sat on it as it is written do not be afraid daughter zion see your king is coming seated on a donkey's colt at first, his disciples did not understand all this. After Jesus was glorified, did they realize that these things had been written about him and that these things had been done to him? This is the word of the Lord. darkness we were away without hope without light till from heaven you came running there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets to a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt Praise the Son, praise the 
Thousand angels surround your throne to bring you praise that will never cease. But hallelujah from here below is still your favor and melody. We Should the fire that once burned bright become an ember my eyes can't see, I will remember your sacrifice, I will abide in
Lord, we declare our praise to you right now. We say hallelujah. The only thing that's required is that your presence comes. And it doesn't matter, Lord, if there are eight people in the room or 8,000. What matters most is your presence. So, Lord God, we want to draw close to you right now. Your living presence. We trust in you. We trust, Lord, that as you speak into our lives through prayer, through song, through every act of worship, through the word, God, every bit of it, Lord, we would just hear you. We trust in you. We need you. We need you. Thank you, Lord. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, I think I can speak for the... uh, rest of the staff um we're missing you guys (laughs) we are really missing you guys and um we uh we are finding that these are just uh really extraordinary times and probably in some ways more difficult than we thought in some ways it, it, it seems to be this uh, situation where, whether it's through live stream or um, things we do on Facebook or uh, videos that we put together, you know, we've got a new YouTube channel now for the church, and it it's it's one of those things that kind of grips your heart and your mind. Like, have we done enough? Have we done enough? And um, so my prayer is that just in this moment here. The only thing that matters is that you worship God. That's all that matters. So whether whether it's a, a situation of, of technology that doesn't quite work or or your computer decides to, to, to do a, the funky chicken on you or whatever it is, you worship God. That's it. And um, we're thankful that we have this opportunity. So we're gonna we're we're shifting gears you know we've been in a series for the last five weeks called who do you think you are and we're going to transition to something that i think in in the in the church world we um we have the tendency to overlook a little bit not that we don't know that it's there but it's one of those things i think in our walk with christ that we sometimes take for granted and it's eternal life the gift of eternal life. And we're going to focus for the next couple of weeks about that. And I, this is really appropriate for, here we are at this weekend of, of Palm Sunday weekend, celebrating the triumphal arrival of Jesus Christ into Jerusalem, and then all the events that take place in the Holy Week. But I think, too, we sometimes don't always make the connection between what happens in this week even right to the cross and then the resurrection, that, that like, oh yeah, if it wasn't for that, I would not have the hope of eternal life. I mean, there would be nothing. There would be nothing to have hope for. And so we're going to focus for the next couple of weeks on that very topic of uh, eternal life. And so um, we're going to look in the scriptures. We're going to go to Matthew chapter 21. And we're going to look at verses 28 through 32 and I, have, I so i have a question for you about eternal life and um something to think about it's simply this who gets to go to heaven i mean who who really gets in who gets the gift of eternal life and sometimes we can kind of form our own uh idea about that whether it aligns up with scripture or not um 
this, this is a question that I have found uh, preoccupies more of the unchurched than the churched. And we find that in, in our culture, lots of different ideas about eternal life. Who gets to go in? Who gets in? What are the requirements? Who's, who, who is God really looking for here? Well, we're going to get into the word here about this. And, and the word is going to show us that, you know, maybe some of our ideas about who gets into heaven could be challenged a little bit. You know, is it the law-abiding, super-religious, Ten Commandment quoting, special social need meeting Christian? Is it that person? Is it the outcast, lost, um, discouraged, angry, broken person? Is that who gets in? Well, I have another question for you, and this ties in with maybe our idea about who gets in. And it's this question here. Does your profession match your practice? Does what you profess with your lips match the actions of what you practice? Are they congruent with each other? Are they lined up with each other? Well, I want us to look at Matthew chapter 21. I want you to read with me. Hopefully you've got there in your Bibles, Matthew 21, verses 28 through 32. So let's, uh, let's read that together. This is a, a, a parable that Jesus tells. Now, from Matthew 21 on in your Bible is the last week of Jesus' life. There's some of the most foundational and profound moments in the life of Christ that happen from Matthew 21 all the way to Matthew 28. It's, it's incredible what goes on. And from Matthew 21 through chapter 23 is one continuous teaching and dialogue that happens in the temple. Now, this is all after Jesus has arrived on a donkey into Jerusalem, where everybody is celebrating the arrival of the Messiah, and, and the palm branches are being laid down, and garments are put down on the road, and and, and, and just all this celebration is taking place. It's one of those things that, that literally rocked the foundations of Jerusalem. It was that significant. Matter of fact, I'm going to give you a teaser. On Monday, you're going to hear uh, Pastor Mendy talk about this in her Holy Week teaching that you're going to be able to see on Monday, just the significance of that event itself. So this is, by the time we get here, this has already taken place. And the other thing that's happened is Jesus is constantly being confronted by the Pharisees, the teachers of the law, the elders. It's, it's relentless, okay? So we're going to pick it up here in verse 28, where, again, Jesus is answering a question and an accusation from the Pharisees and <clears throat> teachers of the law. Verse 28 says this, but what do you think about this? A man with two sons told the older boy, Son, go out and work in the vineyard today. Verse 29. The son answered, no, I won't go. But later he changed his mind and went anyway. Then, then the father told the other son, you go. And he said, yes, sir, I will. But he didn't go. Which one of the two obeyed his father? And they replied, the first. Then Jesus explained his meaning. I tell you the truth. Corrupt tax collectors and prostitutes will get into the kingdom of God before you do. That's some shock value right there to the Pharisees. For John the Baptist came and showed you the right way to live, but you didn't believe him, while tax collectors and prostitutes did. And even when you saw this happening, you refused to believe him and repent of your sins. So this is, this is something that didn't set real well with the Pharisees. Because Jesus is, is directly addressing this whole issue of profession versus practice. Of what's really going on in your heart and, and, and who gets in, who who gets to go to heaven? Who gets the gift 
of eternal life. And like I said earlier, you could read Matthew 21, 22, and 23, and just about every, not every, just every chapter, but every paragraph, it seems like it starts off with things like, so the Pharisees approached Jesus with, or it says at the end, after the Pharisees heard this, they then, it just, it's ongoing. And I, I wonder about this part of Jesus' life. If the humanity of the Savior is at this place of just absolute emotional stress and anxiety, maybe frustration. I mean, just, just think about the, the relentless attacking that's going on when maybe just a few hours prior, the entire city was celebrating him. I can only imagine what, what he must be feeling at this time. So when we read this parable, as Jesus teaches it, there's some things I want us to think about. We have two sons who are represented. Now, maybe in your Bible it says the older son and the other son. Maybe your translation says the first son and the second son. Okay, it, it's, it's, both are correct. These two sons represent two groups of people. One group are the corrupt uh, tax collectors and prostitutes. And the other group are the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. The other part is the father or the landowner that's represented here. This represents God. And then the vineyard represents this community of Israel where the work needs to be done. This vineyard is the place to, to put your hand to the plow and get busy with the work. So you've got all of these things going on, but I really want us to focus on the two sons. And hopefully, I don't know, through the power of God's word, that we will begin to understand what's Jesus saying to you and I. And I, my prayer is that at least for the next maybe 25 or so minutes, we'll set aside our um, judgments and opinions and paradigms about who's righteous and who's unrighteous. Can we do that? And all of you out there on your TVs are nodding. Yes, we could do that. Let's just let's see what happens here. So we've got a couple groups of people that Jesus is really wanting us to focus on through using this analogy in the parable of the two sons. Now, what's interesting about this parable, these two sons, neither one of them are good, okay? There's the one that said, no way I want to work in your vineyard. I'm not doing it. Kind of disrespectful, kind of like getting his back up. I'm going to do this my way. I got my own thing to do. Now, later he changes his mind. And then you've got the, the other son, oh, my TV's broke. The other son who says, sure, dad, he even calls him sir. There's a certain amount of, um, of respect that's paid there. And so, but then he never shows up. He never shows up for the work and he just kind of does his own thing. So there we go. Now it's back. So neither one of these two boys have got their act together. Okay. So just let's, let's understand that. Now, we've got a couple of different groups of people. The first group are the, I would call them the professors, not a professor like a, a teacher or a, a college professor. I'm talking about somebody who professes something about themselves. That the professors that they're professing is much better than they're practicing. Okay, there's, a, there's a disconnect that's going on there, all right? So, so what, what, is that, what does that look like? Well, these are people who are, um, they make great claims about their piety, how religious they are, how many Bible verses they have memorized, right? Uh, they love to show you their, their, their awards for how many years of unbroken attendance in Sunday school, right? That, that's a big thing, right, to the, to the professors. They... Um, they just seem to be a, a subject matter expert on about everything, just about everything, okay? These are the, the, the professors, all right? They, they do a lot of professing. But when it comes right down to it, it's just words. It's just words. There's no consistent actions that back it up. And they, they hang out in great crowds. 
They run in circles that are influential. They have always something to to say, right? They they have an opinion, and it's a well-founded opinion. And by the way, you should agree with their opinion. And and it's just something that, that is all words, all claims, but not much action behind it, okay? Someone who's professing doesn't match up with their practicing. And really, sometimes it could come out to be all judgment and no grace, no grace. Someone who's professing is much better than they're practicing, okay? Now, there's a, another group of people that's mentioned here in the text, and that's the, the practicers, okay? The practicers. The practicers, their practice lines up exactly with their professing, okay? We're looking at the other son now. So the, the, the son that said, sure, dad, sir, I'll go. I'll be in your vineyard. And then never shows up. That's the professing that doesn't match the practicing. But now with this son, the professing and the practicing line right up. Dad, I ain't going. And he doesn't go. I'm going to do this my way. I got my ideas about this. This is maybe their hearts are hard. Maybe there's some rebellion in there. Some materialistic thinking, uh, control enthusiasts, not control freaks, they're control enthusiasts. It's a nice way to say it. And they can be found and heard in saying things like, I don't need the church. I don't need God. I don't need anybody. I'm going to take care of me. You want me to do something, Dad? You want me to work in the vineyard? Nah, going to pass that up. And their professing lines up exactly with their practicing this is the other group of people that jesus is talking about and this in a kind of a weird twisted way these are actually pretty true to them to themselves people there's no uh, you know lack of congruence between what they're saying and what they're doing they're actually being pretty true but again, in this sense, the, the son that said, no, nope, I'm not going, you know, he didn't go. Now, later he changed his mind. But in either case, you've got, you've got a couple of sons here who, who just, they don't have it together. It's not coming together for them. And in these two groups of people that Jesus is using in the parable, he does something rather powerful when in verse uh, 31, Jesus says this, when he asked the question to the Pharisees, which one of the two obeyed the father? And they replied, the Pharisees replied, the first, the one who said, dad, I'm not going to go. And then he shows up. And then Jesus explained his meaning when he says this in the rest of verse 31, I tell you the truth, corrupt tax collectors and prostitutes will get into the kingdom of God before you do. And he's looking right at the Pharisees when he says this. And basically, he's letting the Pharisees know, you know those corrupt, horrible people that are kind of like the first son? They're going to see the kingdom of God before you do, which totally assaults their ideas about being religious, about being, you know, we've got it all figured out. Our words, our, our, our pious ways, that is the way to heaven. That is the way to the kingdom of God. And Jesus is saying, you know what? They're, they're going to get in before you do. And that is a serious challenge on their thinking, and I, and I fear in our thinking as well about eternal life. And here's the thing that I discovered as I read more and more in this parable, that in the end, that first son, the one that said, no, I don't want to work in the vineyard and I'm not going to, and then changes his mind and goes back, that even in the most brokenness and rebellious, God can still soften the heart. God can still lead. God can still bring hope and an answer. And these parables were very, very upsetting to the religious leaders because the more they heard Jesus talk about this, the more 
It was about them. And it was about their unwillingness to simply be people that their profession matched their practice. And they saw that that was not what Jesus saw in them. And this got them super upset. So here's the question. Well, practicers, we talked about this. Practice, you know, their line, lines right up with their professing. But here's the question. So who is God looking for? Who is he really looking for? Who is it that God is saying, listen, you want to know who gets eternal life. You want to know who gets in. You want to know who gets heaven. Let me show you. And he uses this parable to explain it. Those whose professing matches their practicing is who God is looking for. Now, there's a passage of Scripture I want you to guys to go to. It's in the Old Testament. Turn back in your Bibles to Micah. Micah chapter 6. The same issue is going on with the nation Israel and, and God is speaking through the prophet Micah about this very thing. Micah chapter 6, verse 6, and we're going to read through verse 8. It's on page 752 of my Bible. Maybe that puts you in the ballpark. Okay, Micah 6, 6 says this. What can we bring to the Lord? Should we bring him burnt offerings? Should we bow before God most high with offerings of yearling calves? Should we offer him thousands of rams and 10,000 rivers of olive oil? Should we sacrifice our firstborn children to pay for our sins? No. O oh, people, the Lord has told you what is good, and this is what he requires of you, to do what is right, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Our um, piety, <laughs> our religiousness, our well-meaning sacrifices and acts of service and, and being as religious as we can possibly be, that's not what God's looking for. That's not what his heart is about. And we see it again here in the teachings of Christ. Who is God looking for? Well, those who, who's professing matches their practicing what so what does that look like how does that apply to us well i believe this parable it becomes a uh, a mirror it becomes a mirror that we look at and go okay hmm two different groups of people here am i in one of those groups where's where's my place in this teaching that jesus is giving so i have a question for you have you and I believed and lived like the first son? Like the first son. The one son that said, I'm not going in the vineyard. Don't want to do it. Maybe, you know, we've come to a place where our ways are set. My heart is hard and it's hurt. Things just did not turn out like I thought they would. In my life. And so as a result of that. Nobody's going to tell me what to do. And I certainly don't need God. To just kind of say. This is the way you should go. I, I've tried the God thing. I've been in the church. That's where I got hurt for crying out loud. Maybe that's the world that you might be in. And the more that we, we dwell on that. The, we, we get angrier. And, 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 and the hardness of our heart increases. And the distance grows. And even have the thought of having a relationship with God and working in his vineyard. Don't want to do it. Not interested. Maybe that's where you see yourself in this parable. Well, there's one thing that's true about you. Your words and your actions are totally lining up. There's a consistency there. Well, guess what? This parable is a lifeboat for you if you are that first son. Because God is still 
coming to you saying, come to me and I will give you rest. Come to me. I know you're broken. I know you're hurting. I know you're angry. I know that there's a hardness of heart. I am still here to rescue you. This parable is a lifeboat. And God still calls you into his kingdom and to experience eternal life. Maybe you have believed and lived like the second son. That son that said, oh, yes, father, I absolutely I am the chosen one. I am the favored one. And I'm going to I'm going to give you my respect. And yes, I am going to go into that vineyard and I will work for you. But it just never seems to come together. And you never go into the vineyard. You look good talking about the vineyard, right? And and we 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 have this sense of uh, feeling right about the vineyard. Yes, the vineyard is a good thing. We should all work in the vineyard. As a matter of fact, I want to carry the banner about working in the vineyard. We all got to be there, but I never go. And I talk about all the things that you can learn in the vineyard and how wise you could be like me, but I never go. And there doesn't seem to be a lineup between what I profess and what I practice. I say the right things. I have the right associations. The crowd I run in is the crowd. It's the crowd. But it's all just words and appearances there's nothing to it there's no substance well guess what this parable for you it's a warning it's a warning about saying one thing and doing another now if you find that maybe in your life there's this sense of like man i i am kind of like that second son and I'm not here to tell you that you are. That's, that's the Holy Spirit's job. That is God's job to bring that light and that truth into your life. And it's, it's, it's really amazing to me. The Pharisees had the chance to make a choice here. When they hear this story, they know Jesus is talking about them. But he gives them the same opportunity that the corrupt tax collectors and the prostitutes have. Will you come? Will you change your mind? Will you allow me to soften your heart? Well, for second son kind of people, this parable is a warning. And still, eternal life can be yours if you let go of yourself. <laughs> if you let go of yourself. Quit holding on so tightly to me. I got to let go of me. And all my ideas about being right, being religious, and being, being the best, thinking that's the way into heaven? No. That's not the way. Here's the thing that I find amazing about eternal life and how and why eternal life is so critical that we understand that God gives this gift of eternal life as we're talking about this week, this holy week, and leading into Easter. There's two powerful stories at work in this story of eternal life the gift of eternal life has two true stories to it story number one is this perfect love of god this perfect amazing love of god where he gives his son jesus christ he loved us so much that he went to the ultimate extreme and saying i will give my son we're going to talk more about that specifically because the very next parable that Jesus talks about is this issue of the love of the Father giving his Son. And so this perfectly true story illustrating this perfect love of God that Jesus was this complete work of redemption for you and I, for the first son and for the second son. So that's the first true story in this story of eternal life but there's a second true story and it's our story it's where we are and it's about what i've been 
professing or what I have been practicing. Maybe my professing has been totally lining up with my practicing, but in a way that's been against God. And maybe, maybe the Spirit of God is touching your heart right now. And like that first son, he changed and he went back to the vineyard. And maybe in your life, this is that moment where you are hearing the still, small voice of the Lord saying, come, the gift of eternal life. I've paid the price to give it to you. This is what Jesus did. This is how his perfect story connects with our story so that we can receive the gift of eternal life. Maybe you're that second son. And as God has worked on your heart, you're realizing, you know, I have been working so incredibly hard to do the right thing, and I still feel empty. I still feel lost. I still feel disconnected. And, and you know, you can look at this parable and go, well, hey, the, so the timeless truth that's in this parable is don't be like the Pharisees. I mean, that's a truth that's in it for sure. But there's a larger truth that's going on. The, the incredible love of God can even reach to the people who act like the second son that, that, that are all about the outward show that seem to have it all together on the outside, that God's love, God's spirit still penetrates their hearts to say, you know what? I still love you and I'm calling you to myself. Maybe you see yourself as that second son. Whatever place you're at in this parable, the gift of eternal life is available for you. And I know that in both sides, that first son could say, you know what? I've done too much. I've gone too far. There is no way that God can accept me. And that second son can say, oh, no, I'm good. I've, I've, I've read all the Bible verses. I've read through the Bible many times. I've, I go to the right church. I do the right things. I give the right sacrifices. And God's love says, no, I am still calling you to accept the gift of eternal life. And so I just want to extend an invitation to you in this moment, this moment right now. An invitation that as we begin this holy week, that, could, that, that God could do a work in your life like he's never done before. Maybe as you read this parable, God just gave you an insight and a burden to someone that you know. Maybe someone in your family. Maybe someone that, that is close to you. That is struggling. Maybe they're this first son. Maybe they're a second son kind of person. I don't know. If you're getting that sense and that impression in your heart and mind right now, stop whatever you're doing and pray for them right now by name. By name. That's an invitation. Maybe the other invitation is in your own heart right now. You are sensing the pull of God's spirit and God's love. And wherever you've been in your life, as this parable is in the word of God, God's spirit has spoken to you. And now is the moment of decision. Now is the moment for you to say, I need a savior and I want the gift of eternal life. To know for certain that the price for my sin has been paid and I have been given this blessing and this privilege to have an eternal relationship with Jesus Christ. Would you just bow your heads and pray with me right now? Lord God, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, that your word is truth. Your word is life. Your word has been inspired and breathed upon by your spirit. And it is your word, Lord, that goes forth. And I'm praying right now, God, that, that through the, the, 
the technologies that we're using, God, that you use all of it how you see fit to speak into the hearts of your people. And Lord, if there are some tonight who are hearing this that are saying, I, I don't know for certain that I have the gift of eternal life. I've been living in this way or that way. Maybe my life has been like the second son or I've been just away from God like the, the first son. I, wherever, wherever they're at, Lord, would you meet them right there, right there? And I pray, Heavenly Father, that they would find an openness and a willingness in their spirit to say yes to you. Lord, I pray right now that as those that are right now praying, their heads are bowed, their eyes are closed, and they're just seeking you, that, Lord, if there's some that want to make a decision tonight to receive Jesus Christ as their Savior, to be given that precious gift of eternal life, an eternal relationship with you, that, Lord, you would just hear their prayer right now by faith. And that, Lord, you would give them a measure of faith to trust in your goodness, that you will forgive their sins, Lord, that you will cleanse their hearts, and that you will place your spirit in them. And that, God, you would remind them by your spirit that they are part of the kingdom of God. We say yes, Lord. And we pray all of this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Let's worship. You are the word at the beginning. One with God. Okay.
My prayer for you is that as we enter this holy week, that we would enter it with hearts that are inclined toward Christ. That our minds, our time, everything that we would do for the next seven days, leading right up to Resurrection Sunday, would be something that would change us, move us, and conform us to the heart of God. May God grant you with his peace, his favor, his blessing, and his amazing wisdom in your life as you walk each day with Christ. God bless you. Be in peace. Amen.